Japanese government officials have shown the surest sign yet that they intend to make nuclear power a key part of Japan's future. They've drafted a policy that describes it as an important energy source. NHK World's Yoichiro Tateiwa has more. We will figure out how much nuclear power we need, and we will secure that amount. The draft document, adopted by a group of cabinet ministers, endorses a major change in Japan's energy policy. The nuclear accident in Fukushima three years ago triggered a nationwide debate over nuclear power. The ruling party at that time promises to phase out nuclear energy within 30 years. Shinzo Abe's return to power in the December 2012 election changed the situation. The prime minister called the elimination of nuclear power irresponsible. The draft energy policy adopted on Tuesday says the government will restart reactors once they clear the latest safety regulations. The document also underlines the need to learn from the nuclear accident and the importance of safety. But some people question whether it is really safe to resume operations at nuclear power plants. Among them is the governor of Niigata. His prefecture hosts the world's largest nuclear plant operated by Tokyo Electric Power Company. TEPCO hasn't learned from the Fukushima accident. It's not qualified to operate nuclear plants. Paul Scalise is an expert on Japan's energy policy. He explains the rationale behind the government's renewed emphasis on nuclear power. You have Japan's very precarious lack of natural resources uh, and the hope that by moving away from fossil fuels like imported gas oil and coal, uh, that you can avoid the very disruptive uh, shocks to both electricity prices as well as gas prices that took place in the 1970s. Scalise says the energy policy will be welcomed by the business community. But he adds the utilities and the government need to display more transparency in order to convince the general public. Engineers are to test the plan to deal with the massive buildup of radioactive wastewater at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. They'll try to freeze soil to stop the water flowing. They'll begin the test on March 11th at the earliest. The amount of wastewater has been increasing. 400 tons of groundwater is flowing beneath the facilities from nearby mountains every day. The government plans to spend more than $300 million to build frozen walls around the number one to number four reactors. The test will be conducted at the number four reactor. Engineers will drive steel pipes to a depth of 30 meters in an area measuring 100 square meters. They'll inject liquid coolant at a temperature of minus 40 degrees into these pipes. The refrigerant is expected to freeze the soil in a month or so. Engineers will check whether the frozen wall can stop the flow of groundwater despite the presence of piping or other structures beneath the soil. They'll also study how to replace the pipes. The government and TEPCO aim to start building full-scale walls in the fiscal year that starts in April. But some engineering and geology experts doubt that frozen walls of such an unprecedented size can be properly maintained over the long term. Managers at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant have reported a new problem. They say a cooling system for a pool of spent nuclear fuel temporarily stopped working. An alarm indicating an electrical problem went off on Tuesday morning. The cooling system at the number four reactor building stopped because of a partial power failure. Managers say workers digging on a nearby road may have damaged an electrical cable. They switched to an alternative power supply and resumed cooling in the afternoon. Officials at the plant's operator, Tokyo Electric Power Company, say temperatures in the pool didn't rise significantly. A hydrogen explosion damaged the reactor building in the wake of the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. Workers have been removing spent fuel rods from the pool and transferring them to a storage facility. The power failure forced them to suspend operations, 
but they were able to resume work Colonel in the experts afternoon. experts commissioned by the government has endorsed a proposal on how to choose locations for burying radioactive waste. The Nuclear Waste Management Organization, or NUMO, submitted the proposal. The organization is responsible for building disposal facilities. The panel includes experts in the fields of seismology, volcanoes, and groundwater. They met to discuss how NUMO plans to select sites to permanently store the waste deep underground. The guidelines say the waste should not be buried near active geological faults or within 15 kilometers of volcanoes. They also recommend avoiding places where water could permeate. However, some members of the panel are calling for more discussions on whether underground storage is safe. Operators of a nuclear plant near Tokyo have come up with an unusual step in a bid to restart its operations. They plan to explain safety measures to local governments before they apply for approval at the national level. Officials with Japan Atomic Power Company say they hope to reach an agreement with leaders of 11 local governments as soon as next week. They include a village that hosts the Tokai No. 2 nuclear plant. The agreement will require the company to outline safety measures to local governments before it applies to the Nuclear Regulation Authority for safety screening. Japan Atomic Power officials would also pledge to get support from six local governments near Tokai. Analysts say the agreement will give local governments a stronger voice in approving nuclear plants. Nearly one million people within 30 kilometers of the Tokai facility would have to leave their homes if a series, uh, serious accident occurred. Now the top United Nations official for disaster risk reduction is urging nations to plan for natural disasters rather than think of them as inescapable events. She's in Japan to prepare for an international conference scheduled for March of next year in Sendai. The city was hit hard by the massive earthquake and tsunami in March 2011. Getting away from this idea that this a disaster is an event, it happens, you pay for it and move on. It really has to become part, core to countries planning for themselves. Margarita Wallström, the UN Special Representative of the Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction, spoke to NHK in Tokyo on Monday. She noted that awareness of disaster management has improved across the globe, but there's still room for improvement. Wallström also said many countries are looking to Japan, hoping it will share the lessons it has learned from a variety of disasters. The island south of Tokyo has more than tripled in size since the volcanic eruption started in November. Officials with Japan Japan's meteorological agencies say the island will probably become larger as the eruption shows no sign of ending. The eruption was the first in 40 years in the Ogasawara Island chain. The new landmass created by the lava merged with Nishinoshima Island by the year end. The island is now three and a half times its original size. Officials say the new land measures half a square kilometer. They estimate that at least 10 million cubic meters of lava flowed out by February 4th. Officials say the eruption is producing about 100,000 cubic meters of lava a day. Vessels navigating near the island are being warned to stay on the island. When diving for shells and came up with a lot more than he bargained for. Tetsuo Okamoto spotted a giant squid four meters below the surface. The creature was more than four meters long and weighed about 200 kilograms. Okamoto tied it to his boat and took it back to port. I was stunned to see the giant creature. I've been fishing at sea for decades, but I've never seen anything like that. Giant squid live deep in the ocean. Several have been found this winter in the Sea of Japan. It is quite rare for a giant squid to come up from the deep waters. Researchers will examine the squid to find out why it came so to the surface. news was busy airing a war criminal's pity party, what major news story was being missed? Well, earlier this month there was another radioactive leak, and I'm not even talking about Fukushima. Last week, officials confirmed that the waste isolation pilot plant near Carlsbad, New Mexico, experienced the highest radiation levels in the facility's history after there was a leak inside of a salt tunnel where radioactive material is stored. Now, although plant officials are maintaining that there is no current threat, there is still little known about the extent of the leak or how to reduce current radiation levels in and around the site. Not to mention that it took days for officials to even announce that the leak had happened. 
In fact, Edward Lyman, a nuclear expert at the Union for Concerned Scientists, told the LA Times that, quote, if there is airborne contamination and it involves plutonium, they are going to need to decontaminate, excuse me, surfaces. If it's in the ventilation system, it could have spread to other areas. And it's not just nuclear waste storage sites that are vulnerable to these types of leaks. In fact, just last year, the same organization released a report stating that over the past three years, 40 of the 104 U.S. nuclear reactors sustained at least one near miss. Now, a near miss is when an event, such as a failure of a cooling system, occurs that increases the chance of a core meltdown by a factor of 10, forcing the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to investigate. Furthermore, last April, former chairman of the NRC, Gregory Yatsko, told the New York Times that all of America's 104 reactors have safety problems that cannot be fixed and must be replaced with new technology. Interestingly, he waited until after his time as head of the NRC to make this recommendation. Helpful stuff, Greg. Thanks. But these types of reports seem to be of little concern to energy department officials as two new nuclear reactors are set to be built for the first time in nearly 30 years. Just last week, Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz traveled to Georgia to issue multi-billion dollar loan guarantees for the construction of two reactors in the state. So while Obama continues to promote an all of the above approach to U.S. energy, humanity will continue to suffer from the unlearned lessons of technological insanity.